Thank you for joining us today for five ways to increase value creation utilizing RPA in an M&A process. Our presentation should last about 30 to 40 minutes with some time at the end for questions. Let's get started. This is a great example of taking unstructured data using a bot to map out standardized format. So in this case, a worksheet, um, while this example is generic in nature, you can imagine the power that it has at scale. The technology has the ability to digitally transform much of manual and uh, repetitive work that people are doing today. Here, I'll play it again so you can see it. The impact on the business outcomes is great. So thanks for joining us today. I'm excited to expand on this video that you just watched and talk about how technology is changing in the M&A space. Before we get started, there are a couple of items that we're going to walk through today. So we have the M&A landscape in 2019 and beyond, problems that slow the process, and then five ways RPA can increase value creation. And we'll wrap up again with questions and answers. A few highest housekeeping notes. We are recording the session and we'll send out a copy after the event. If you have any questions throughout, be sure to ask using the panel on the right-hand side. As you saw in the first example, automation is digitally transforming many businesses, including the M&A space. So whether your organization is trying to innovate, do better work, or solve new problems, technology has the ability to enable it all. Today, we're going to specifically cover the barriers to value creation and M&A deals, how to develop a technology strategy to speed delivery, and as a result, realize tangible outcomes in a short amount of time, giving you the ability to scale for future use cases. I'm sure many of you have heard the buzz of RPA, and it's not a surprise given the market growth rates you can see on the right-hand side. What is RPA though? So RPA is just a robot doing human manual laborious tasks. So RPA can automate any redundant rule-based manual processes. And it is um, driving user interface, it's speeding up transactions, and it's doing more um, with existing teams. Many organizations are at different places along the RPA journey, but for most, change is, has shifted from understanding and education to how to scale and establish center of excellences. So organizations are seeing real value in utilizing RPA tools today. And what follows are proven ways to move you down your RPA journey in an M&A process. But before we get started, let's introduce my guest speaker and we'll tell you a bit more about ourselves. So in order to drive successful RPA implementations, we utilize partners like Data Solutions Group, DSG, to help clients through the preparation work that is necessary for development of bots, including the RPA strategy process streamlining, and of course, change management. So these consultants are very important to us, and they provide talent governance and guidance on creating the appropriate organizational model to integrate and scale automation. So I will let Vic further introduce himself and his company. Vic? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for attending and thank you, Rachel, for the great introduction. Very pleased to be presenting with you 
and help system on this very important topic area. My name, Vic Data, um, and I'm the founder of uh, Data Solutions Group based in the greater Washington DC area here in the US. Um, I have uh, about 25 years of professional services background, uh, mostly coming from the finance and accounting areas, but a healthy dose of IT, which I've had the benefit of receiving in very outstanding firms I've worked with, Deloitte, IBM, KPMG, and FTI Consulting, that you all might be aware of. With that experience, I founded DSG a few years ago as an advisory firm that offers corporate finance solutions to mid-market companies, and we saw a need there uh, where they were underserved. Our transformation, our M&A, and turnaround solution skills are highly requested by leaders of these companies. Uh, when uh, they have specific issues and need to grow rapidly, either through organic means or via acquisitions. Um, and our, our mission is to provide these, these uh, great companies with the tools, the training, the techniques in order to make better decisions under extreme uncertainty these days. We're also called upon uh, when these f firms and these companies are under stress and require expertise to turn around struggling operations. And over our professional 10 years, my team and I have participated in over 100 transformative programs, delivered tens of millions of dollars in incremental value, um, and reduced, highly reduced cost at our clients without you know, disturbing their processes and, uh, and, their, uh, and their people. We have also conducted many due diligence exercises for buyers and sellers in the M&A process. What we specifically bring to an RPA engagement is something, uh, next slide please, Rachel. Um, <clears throat> what we specifically bring to an RPA engagement is something more important, uh, representing the precursor work which is necessary to make any uh, technical, and an RPA may be technical, but it's also a balance between the art and the science. Uh, of, of deploying such, such tools. We help identify projects that could gain by RPA in your environment. We assist you in preparing the workforce to take on RPA. And then we rationalize and help you harmonize processes so that your RPA solution can operate optimally. We, joke, we don't just do this and walk away. We also manage the project through a project management office, which we help you set up. And we even help design a center of excellence for RPA if that is so desired to ensure that your digital culture is sustained through the, you know, through the journey for, uh, for uh, digital transformation. Rachel. Wonderful. Really excited to uh, proceed to the rest of the presentation here. So we at Health Systems at a glance. We've been in business now for 35 years. Uh, we started uh, the business in 1982 and we've grown um, globally um, and we now have offices all around the world and uh, we have 17,000 customers worldwide uh, with revenue of over 200 million. Um, so we are really focused on the support uh, staff and um, they have an average of nine years of experience and uh, the workplace is really offering a high quality of software. Thanks, Rachel. Um, let's get into the guts of uh, why we really need uh, RPA. And I think at the 50,000 foot level, I think it's important to talk about uh, the, uh, the market for RPA. Um, the, on the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see uh, that there is a couple of bar charts that show uh, the M&A activity that is um, you know, trending upwards. Uh, this is the fifth consecutive year M&A deal value in just North America will top $2 trillion. Uh, this is a uh, unprecedented and historic event, I think. Um, the bar chart below shows that the deal uh, multiples, uh, that is each, the size of each deal, the expected ROI from each of these um, tends to go up as well every year, and that has gone unabated over the last few years. Um, mostly firms are buying companies to extend their existing operations, get into 
geographic markets or into um, channels they didn't have or to diversify and buy the technology that they don't have. And a lot of the transactions are happening with technical firms where uh, companies are trying to expand their technology arms and their digital arms. So there is a lot of uh, activity going on uh, in, in that space, uh, but most of it is very new to the acquirers. And so it's gonna be interesting to see how well they integrate these acquisitions. There is a lot of money still around. Uh, it's tightening up, but there is a lot of cash sloshing around. Good deals are hard to find these days, but uh, the returns for these acquisitions is also getting extremely stringent. So anybody who lends money is asking for more proof, more rationale to uh, provide the cash. On the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see a uh, number of items on a, um, uh, on, on a, on a a pie chart that shows why um, these people are worried, these acquirers are worried. Uh, effective integration and sound due diligence was, was cited as being the, the single two big, biggest important factors for a successful transaction. So doing your due diligence um, before you get into the process and then of, of buying a company or selling a company is very important, as well as the fact that once you buy it, uh, effectively integrating it uh, will result in the re the returns that are being demanded by your uh, by the company's lenders. It's also true that less than five percent of all M and A transactions fail to live up to their project uh, projected synergies and values, while ninety five percent apparently destroy value for the shareholders. So this is a problem, significant one that we're trying to mitigate with RPA. Next. This slide um, is important to show you as we peel this onion further, why uh, these transactions internally have not worked. So a little bit more detail coming from research done by Deloitte recently, um, highlighted external factors of lack of good due diligence, but also the fact that uh, there is execution integration issues, talent and cost issues that are not being addressed correctly. Um, those you know, give you about the 80-20 rule there. Um, people are buying companies, they're putting the processes, good processes, good integration on hold, and they're doing it fast, and they're trying to uh, ensure that they get the results um, over time so that the people and the process issues are subordinated to the actual acquisition. On the right-hand side, you'll see a slew of, of uh, rationale why integration goes wrong. Most importantly, underestimating one-time costs or counting one-time revenue as recurring is considered to be uh, a big reason why these uh, integrations are failing. And companies are also failing to make these estimates real. Uh, they're providing a very rosy picture obviously, uh, to uh, either sell this company or um, provide the rationale to buy, you know, to buy the companies as well. Um, there's a lot of data sprawl with no ability to get a combined picture of financials, products, customers, or channels. And data formats and standards are vastly different between two companies with no real idea of how to bring them all together once the companies merge. Very cursory efforts are done by many companies to do that. Most importantly, underlying all of this is that culture and processes are being uh, put on the low end, on the back burner uh, when companies merge. And then they realize uh, that, as we will see as we go through the rest of this uh, presentation, that uh, these elements really do impact a uh, uh, and effective integration. Next. We'd be remiss if we didn't show you something on the ROI for uh, for RPA. Uh, again, a very uh, rich slide <laughs> and to show you uh, what the rationale is for RPA. On the left-hand side, you'll see we provided a number of uh, leading research firms comments, Gartner McKinsey Institute of RPA, that reduce risk of human data entry errors or the risk that data of human corruption, theft or malpractice 
impacts um, you know companies uh, that's a rationale for going forward with anything that is automated uh, the revenue and profit generated becomes less dependent on the ability to scale your labor because automation enhances your ability of your current resources rather than you know replaces it often and the company deploying RPA can rapidly scale up or down depending on the nature of the business issue they're facing. And finally, RPA processes, um, uh, processes activities in exactly the same manner, providing consistency without the element of human variability. So there are many reasons why you would undertake um, RPA and then the further, you know, um, uh, variants of RPA as, as we'll go forward in, in time to see cognitive learning and AI become a big part of the lexicon as well. On the right-hand side, the one thing I want to just uh, mention here is that in the past, not so much in the distant past, uh, when you had an onshore, let's say, shared service center, you would experience, let's say, a dollar worth of, um, uh, of savings. Uh, you literally can um, improve that by using a bot by uh, a tenth of that as well. So th the cost of using a bot in the most transactional of processes is absolutely without fail. We've, we've seen it unfold in at many of our clients and the inherent benefits of accuracy, timeliness, and the impartiality of having a bot in place is unmistakable. So. Uh, there's a there's a large benefit to be had by by most companies resulting in between 15 and 90 percent cost reduction opportunities uh, for for many firms that we've been with. Next, Rachel, do you want to take this? Sure, absolutely. So we covered uh, some of the integration issues in previous slides that led to value uh, destruction. So let's go a little bit deeper and show you how RPA really helps mitigate these issues. So most integration issues are arising from making rosy projections of revenue and cost reduction, assuming that uh, a, f a free flow of all necessary data uh, will come in a consumable form. And data, um, it's also the assumption that data will be clean and will continue to be clean. And assuming that the workflows will, force will be operating with the knowledge, the ability, or empowerment to execute, and then the same speed. Uh, so this type of thinking causes 60 to 70% of mergers to fail, as Vic was just saying. Ensure it mimics human process, process activities and also helps automate mundane tasks. But also RPA impacts the entire extract, so transfer, cleanse, load process of data management. It does some incredible data capture, ETL, and necessary activities that empower decision makers in making realistic projections providing clean data via accurate data extraction and staging, and then providing time savings via 24-7, 360 active processing. Providing time for the workforce to focus on higher value tasks, and then providing a learning environment for advanced artificial intelligence and a release of innovation. So we are going to next walk you through the top integration issues and details on how RPA actually mitigates each of these issues uh, towards enduring success. The, um, the issue is one of grounding estimates. So we'll look at it this way. Uh, the issue is getting real with uh, estimates. So one of the issues is not having enough information to project sales growth and cost reductions, um, maybe overestimating one-time costs or revenue items uh, as recurring. Then RPA, you know, is really providing the following benefits. 
So it provides uh, information from both companies rapidly helping identify the growth rules that are mismatched, identifying redundant information, eliminating wasteful side analysis and reconciliations, um, and helping to determine the types of information externally and then internally that drive more effective forecasts. That's great. Rachel, I would say that just to add um, from a, you know, a project standpoint, you know, RPA is not a solution for everything. Uh, this is not something that we want to, you know, go out on a limb to say that uh, in, in, the, in the practice of, of doing M&A integration, but it provides great assists to the, to the team. The ability to quickly stage your historical information, enable better data analysis and mining um, you know, we've done that several times over at companies, but now with advancements in this robotic process automation and getting the more uh, mundane of tasks, as you were just saying, um, has resulted in great gains at one of our banking clients recently. Uh, they, the, 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 the bots now pour through, you know, tomes of data uh, for a customer to identify suspicious patterns in transaction history, for example, and flag it, right? And and it used to be done highly manually, and of course now it's being done with uh, a, a, a lot more um, precision as well as a lot more attention. Great point, absolutely. And uh, the issue is um, data mapping to new systems. So the challenges uh, presented in data mapping is that there are multiple levels of complexities caused by business practices and culture that slow the integration down. So multiple sets of products and estimates of growth um, ERP subsystems that organize data differently from uh, the parent company. And then um, Really, the ability to for RPA to vastly improve the area of data mapping is so the the source of uh, data is not an issue. Uh, many paths to one truth, of course. So the creation of a single source truth and the faster design of master data to early identification of common classes of data. That's great, and I think in terms of um, this mapping to new systems. This is kind of bread and butter. Um, often RPA is about moving information between two or more separate pieces of software. Uh, it's fast and it's cheap and it's also fade away. So, you know, in the context of doing M&A, it's really great for, our, uh, for, for example, for our private equity clients who don't want to invest in a new system to um, pull information together. In the interim stage, while they are considering any kind of new ERP for both companies. Uh, it's a fast and easy and cheap way to um, pull information together. In fact, I think as we were just talking recently, it's a great way uh, to actually construct an API uh, within the M&A context, which will benefit any acquirer. We've seen an order come through at our clients in system A, a product needs to be shipped via system B, a patient needs uh, you know, a, a patient checks into a hospital, for example, through system, you know, D, and a doctor needs to see the patient in another information system. Um, you know, we we see a lot of those kinds of integrative issues that um, when you're piecing together various uh, transaction types, um, you know, RPA really does help you stage the information and then help map to the new system uh, in a very quick way. Absolutely, and that's really something that any business can utilize RPA for, um, and it's such a, a great um, way to um, move data around and uh, utilize RPA. Uh, so the, the third key issue is data sourcing and extracting. So the challenge presented in data sourcing lie mainly in consistent data and definition, so high levels of product customization, and then many different SKUs. So RPA has highly effective and 
um, efficient data mapping because business rules are enforced. So the better the business rules are and uh, definition and the more consistently uh, applied, the better the results. So we can integrate two different systems. RPA can also take um, data from forms or invoices and put that data into an ERP or similar type of application. This is something that we're doing all the time for, again, many different um, types of, of organizations and, and businesses. So the fourth key issue is data remediation and transformation. So the key or the challenges presented here are in the inconsistencies in the recording and collecting of the data. So guide reconciliations, um, inconsistently applied external formats accepted without mapping. And then as before, RPA has highly effective and efficient in data remediation transformation. So enabling input, input and verification of manual processes. So traditionally applied with RPA, um, but enhanced for larger data sources. And then data uh, duplication or deduplication and uh, data extraction applied to new data sources such as IoT machine logs and other system generated raw data. I would agree with that. And I'd say, uh, just to add to that, uh, that RPA is being used by lots of companies uh, to quickly identify these data fields that fail to meet a rule set. And this is important when we're doing a fast paced merging of data uh, from one company to another. Target company product sales, for example, does not record region. And then every transaction you can set up that is tagged with location code based on whatever zip plus four, et cetera, or geo code. Uh, you know, you could merge then with the uh, utilizing these rules, uh, tag every uh, sale element and sub sale element um, to that to that transaction for the target company, and thus creating a you know a, a common look to the information coming through your systems now. Uh, this is done super fast once the rule set has been identified because uh, RPA's basic job is to, you know, uh, to go through many systems, identify the, the logic, and, and, and uh, accomplish the tasks uh, in record time. Absolutely. And finally, the fifth key issue is um, data entry and staging. So the challenges presented here are impacted mostly by our clients' manual processes. So any unique data entry requires a workaround. Uh, formatting data for analysis uh, from multiple sources. And as before, RPA um, is really a highly effective and efficient um, tool for um, data staging and entry. So RPA can extract data from common forms, but also from uncommon forms like and data sources like emails. So flexibility to move data from any source to any target database and the ability uh, to only process change data so you don't have to decelerate your system. And um, of course, track your data uh, changes over time with slowly uh, dimensioned logic that is great examples i would just say um at a recent defense contract a client of ours rpa ex expedited the subcontractor hour and rates conversion process by an astounding 5,000 hours allowing the organization to test and remediate and then validate 100 percent of the data in a test environment prior to conversion and then that you know, greatly reduce the amount of data remediation required after the conversion because they were getting uh, so many anomalies. Uh, they were able to test it prior to making it live and um, saved upwards of 5,000 hours. So it's a substantial um, a substantial improvement in, uh, in uh, performance for any company. Vic, that's really impressive. Yeah. 
So identification of key databases for both companies, um, or I should start by saying, you know, the lessons here from deployment are really the identification of uh, those key databases for both companies, but also subsystems that feed those databases. You know, looking at security, security is a bigger and bigger topic every day. Um, robots will only be as secure as the security of your existing environment. So most RPA platforms offer robust security features such as um, data encryption, um, credentials vault, uh, credential um, ex uh, expiration and renewal. Um, master data management concerns itself with the control of an organization's most critical and core data that describes objects and assets, such as customers, employees, or products. So complete and accurate master data uh, contributes to a better decision-making, less cost, less rework, and higher process efficiency and complying to regulations. RPA can do simple and complex business rule validations, which include cross-validations with reference data residing in different systems. Reference data is data that defines the set of permissions that are uh, values beyond or values to be used by other data fields. So options are copying the reference data to the source system to run a simple internal check or looking up the data in the secondary internal or external database. So using RPA, any lookup of reference data can be made feasible, underlying the use of existing high quality sources to run your business processes, meanwhile saving a lot of time. And I think I'll have Vic talk about culture, process, and people. Yeah, thank you, Rachel, because those things are wrappers almost on this great amount of technical information and solution that comes out of RPA. Um, thank you for covering those uh, details uh, in the steps above. Those are important, um, especially master data management to really uh, identify where data goes, uh, the information about information, and the ability to then cluster information in uncertain environments which leads to better um, uh, better decision making or faster decision making. But honestly, prior to doing all this, uh, once we get the permission to go forward uh, at any at any company, uh, culture is the first discussion item <laughs> because culture trumps strategy every day. Uh, that's been said, but we've lived it and we live it with our with our clients. Uh, we can't ignore company politics, especially in areas where managing large teams of people is considered a status symbol. There's often a culture of double and triple checking uh, transactions. It comes from a good place because clients want to be exacting, but there's a cost to pay there. Um, issues that you know took place a few years ago um, continue to uh, you know either stall performance, um, have checkers checking checkers and uh, producing a lot of work load on the human resource. This can, in fact, be alleviated by uh, technology like RPA once there's a secure environment created and process is identified uh, as being a target process for improvement. We, we come in there and we do what we call WIFM and WAMI analysis, which is what's in it for me, what's against my interests. We make certain on this, these change issues, we've identified and we've accounted for any of the networks informally that are existing before any RPA is deployed. RPA, as I reiterate, is not a panacea for all process ills because good business practices are needed, uh, good org design is needed uh, to begin with. Otherwise, you're just automating uh, you know, bad processes and, uh, and ill-defined um, feedback systems. On a process side, <clears throat> RPA automates high transaction processes, which has highly structured information. 
Now, RPA tools can work best when they have direct access to data and applications. It's super important to identify where the data is coming from, who owns it, and what form it is it in. Unstructured data needs to be made structured. So that's in quotes. It needs to be in a standard form um, so that you can include it, even though it's not performed regularly sometimes, it's still okay if you can make it rule-based. So we spend a lot of time working with our clients to take these unstructured pieces of information and identifying what elements of those we can make rules-based and thus you know, better able to accept RPA. And people are the most important here. You know, it's all about the people. You know, preparing for human capital risks is uh, like you'd prepare for any other risk, but in this case, a little bit more. Remember when, remember that when you embark on these kinds of engagements, um, what is it that you actually stand for as a company becomes super important. What is your uh, mission around people? How do you help people find uh, their way through these new technologies? new jobs, new capabilities, new training? And then how do you create an organization that supports uh, this human element for success? That's as important as defining you know, where the processes go because it can only soar once you've enabled people to help uh, push it along. You know, expect changes to jobs, to compensation, to structure, to incentivizations, and learn new ways to develop your team uh, we do recommend, uh, you know, a, a center of, of excellence or a center of competency around uh, this area of um, uh, of RPA and automated technologies within the firm. And we can talk more about it in another setting. Thank you, Rachel. Perfect. And Vic, I could not agree more. Everything you just said. Companies are adopting RPA primarily to solve business problems, but not just to save money. Uh, larger enterprises adapt to maintain competitive advantage. Uh, small and mid-sized companies are attracted to manageable scope, speed, and resource investment. Uh, compliance benefits, you know, think GDPR, HIPAA, PCI. Uh, look at leveraging more effective and efficient business processes, you know, reduced legal issues, accuracy and quality. Think report generation, all that collecting, compiling, better business operations, um, tighter and more reliable data. Data has been something that we've been continuing to bring up this whole conversation. I think it's really important. Productivity. So pots and bots don't take a vacation, which is great. Uh, I hear all the time somebody wants to, you know, go golfing or maybe they get sick. You know, nothing gets done with it when an employee is not in the office. Uh, so think about what can be accomplished. On the flip side, happier employees who get to take those tedious tasks off their plate. And it's great when they know when the bot goes down, you know, how to fix it. <laughs> so, you know, the human factor is not all integrated or, or eliminated as the case is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're really empowering those employees to be more effective and do the things that they want to do and add more value to the business. Wow. So, it uh, looks like we did uh, re receive a couple of questions throughout. Uh, let's see here. looks like the first one, when is the best time to do introduce technology into a business that has been completing M&A transaction for several years? Oh, several years. Um, Rachel, do you want me to answer that and and then oh, you yeah. can you know fill in? Yeah, yeah. Go um, ahead. A very inter a very uh, good question. Um, I think this element of uh, automation discussion starts off during the due diligence phase. Um, you know, even before a company sells uh, itself or divests off its subsidiary, or if a company is actually buying another one, in the due diligence process, you are determining you know, the 
firstly, the fragmentation of information. You're trying to get a sense of how many systems there are. You're trying to get a sense of you know what the key systems are for monetization. And in that, uh, to find places where the human factor is working uh, a lot more to pull information together, that is when you start to uh, both design and strategize around RPA. It's a great place mm -hmm. to look for sub-process automation and where you find analyses being done off the side, not in the main ERPs or in the main uh, systems of record. That's the place that you then identify for, uh, for change and for RPA. I think you nailed it. I wouldn't even add anything to that. Perfect. So the other question that we had was if I am interested in learning about or more about how to implement these strategies in my business, what is the best next step? I would say contact us, contact Vic, and what we can do, you know, it depends. So, you know, it might be a matter of trialing our software. It might be a matter of us working with you on um, creating a couple of um, examples or PSO, P, um, POCs. Um, okay. So, you know, reach out, let us know. We'll help you get started. And I think, Vic, did, did you want yeah, to add I think I would, I would add, uh, Rachel, to that. I think those are great comments. Um, you know, I, I would say that anybody starting an engagement or a effort around, um, you know, automation, and I, and this is a, you know, it's both a heady time, it's an exciting time, as well as you know, pretty vexing and and um, uh, maybe angst-ridden time as well for companies. Um, I think that the first order of business is to really do some brainstorming around, you know, what you have on hand, the capabilities, right? So oftentimes there's some dark technologies and dark capabilities that have not been utilized because we just don't do a good job sometimes of uh, inventorying all our skills and our people and then taking into account the technologies we purchase that haven't been well used or have been used only in a very minor way. I think it's imperative to do that kind of analysis so you're not going out and buying new technology um, just as a, on the basis of, you know, it's a fad or we're going to you know, just get it because you know, somebody has said this is good. Um, I think understanding and baselining where you are uh, is a great way to start. Th there are other ways to approach this. If you have a burning platform where a project is not going as planned, not receiving the results it was supposed to, uh, not achieving them, and then you're seeing a lot of attrition happening as a result of that, that's a great place to bring, you know, a partner in to take a look at and see where maybe you can remove some of the human angst and human factor and have the people focus, like Rachel was just saying, on the most important task, which is the thinking part. And that really alleviates and it's kind of a pressure release for a lot of companies. And we tend to do that. We use many techniques to assist a company in doing that sort of either pressure testing or pressure release uh, exercises with their leadership. And I think that's where uh, I would recommend, you know, uh, you start looking at your, uh, at your technology platform. Wonderful. I think that's perfect. And I don't see any other questions. So if anyone has uh, additional questions, reach out. We'd be happy to um, respond. Thank you so much for everyone for joining. We really appreciate it. Vic, it's been an absolute pleasure um, presenting with you and I'm really looking forward to um, seeing if we have any additional questions. Thanks again, everyone. Thank, thank you, Rachel.